You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Hey, Foundry Church, welcome to worship. As we dive into this, uh, this new series, uh, it really is a continuation on the Christmas story right up into the gospel story of the gospel of Luke. So when we look at it today, we are going to look at how Jesus really um, explodes onto the scene at age 30. He has gone from, in the early chapters of Luke, this, this infant born in a manger in Bethlehem and then the flight to Egypt and back and living in Nazareth. There's been all these years in between and we start looking at the three years, six days, 15 hours, one morning of Jesus Christ's ministry life, the part of him that is most documented, right? This this thing that happens really in Luke chapter 4 and 5, where we see Jesus Christ explode onto the scene. I think the real cultural equivalent that we could make in this is like how um, I remember the first time I saw Uh, somebody said, you kind of see this little kid uh, like he's drumming. And I saw a video of him drumming on a chair, I think it was. And it was this kid and he's just phenomenal rhythm and timing. And you're like, wow, that little kid's like crazy good. And then you start hearing the name everywhere, Bieber, right? Justin Bieber exploded onto the cultural map in the United States and his star just took off and rose so quickly. And he has been in the, in the press and in the pop culture center ever since. His, his star rose quickly and he became a big figure. He exploded onto the scene, right? I was talking with Kyle a little earlier and he even said, like, um, he remembers the first time he saw Bieber was when some girls in his neighborhood said, hey, check out this guy, and they watched a music video of it, right? It was just a quick explosion onto the scene, and then he was everywhere. I think in a lot of ways, we see this in the person of Christ. We see a fast-rising star out of a life that had been, up to that point, 30 years, probably as a carpenter in Nazareth. That's what Jesus had been. He'd been a carpenter. So we look at this and we understand, uh, here's some of what goes on in Luke chapter 4 and 5. We see the baptism. We talked about that in the water series, the baptism of Christ, baptized by John the Baptist. Spirit comes down on him, sends him into the wilderness where he fasts. He doesn't eat for 40 days and is tempted by the devil. And he, he gets through those temptations by the power of the Spirit and discipline and obedience to God. Then we see that Jesus goes back up to his hometown. And on the way there, there's some miracles and things that happen. But in Nazareth, in his hometown, he goes to synagogue. Would be, it would be like going to church goes to synagogue and he comes and they give him the scroll of Isaiah. So he's the preacher for the day. He unrolls the scroll and he reads a portion of Isaiah talking. Um, it's, a, it's a messianic part of it um, where, where he declares that, um, that he is the fulfillment of the words he just read in Isaiah. And the people in Nazareth get mad and they say, hey, isn't this Joseph's son? Kind of a wink and a nudge towards, you know, We've known him a long time. Why does he think he's all this all of a sudden? They get so mad at him that they accuse him of blasphemy and they take him to the, the, the crown of a hill, right? The, the, that's what we called it in Colorado. Um, we always called it the crown of a hill where you could see in all directions off the top, the peak there. Um, they took him to the edge of a bluff and they were going to push Jesus off the edge. And Jesus turns and walks right back through the crowd walks right back through the crowd. They were so mad that he had declared himself Messiah. And they were like, wait a minute, we've known you all your life, right? They, they, there's just this weird element to it and their rejection of Jesus. And Jesus says, a prophet is, not, is, is without honor in his own hometown. So we see that happening. And then we see, um, we're going to look at some of the healings But uh, a couple other things that go on, uh, sandwiching that healing between the rejection at Nazareth and then uh, the kind of close of chapter 5 is Jesus is found to be eating with sinners. He's having dinner parties with people who, uh, who 
are pretty much the worst of the worst. They're kind of horrible people. And Jesus is having dinner with them. And, and one of the Pharisees even kind of gets after Jesus' disciple and says, why does your master eat with you know these, these sinners, these terrible people? And Jesus answers them saying, because I came for the sick, not for the righteous. Right? So Jesus makes that statement. He also talks about fasting, why he doesn't fast. He also talks about new wineskins, which is, a, is, an old, is, is an ancient way of preserving wine. They had put it in goat skins, and as the goat skins dried out and the wine fermented, it would expand and harden. Right, So it was a goat skin of wine, and Jesus talks about these things and um, how new wine skins have to be soft so that when the wine ferments and expands, it doesn't burst the old wine skin. Jesus was saying something new is coming, and the old wine skins can't hold what's about to happen, and Jesus was referring to himself. We go through all this to get to the point that we find ourselves reading today out of Luke chapter 5, verses 17 to 26. And it's this great part of scripture where we see Jesus and some active participants in his ministry and against his ministry. Check it out. Jesus says, or Luke 5, 17 to 26 says, One day Jesus was teaching and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. So we know this, and we're going to unpack who these Pharisees and Sadducees, teachers of the law, are a little bit later. But just know this, super important, super powerful people in the religious structure of Israel. These people, these religious leaders, had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, about 80 miles away. They came to see Jesus on foot 80 miles, which means Jesus must have been doing some amazing things. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat, and they tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because the room, the room was over full and it was, um, the crowd was too big, they went up on a roof and they lowered his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. I love that. Like, can you imagine having a few friends over and eventually you look up and like someone's tearing the roof off to get inside because it's too full. You'd be like, I'm in so much trouble. Like who tears somebody's roof off? I love that that's going on. And it goes on to say that when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this guy who speaks blasphemy? Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew what they were thinking, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Instantly, the man stands up in front of them. He took what he had been lying on, and he went home praising God. Everyone in the, in the room and who heard about it was amazed and gave praise to God, and they were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. There is something really cool going on here that I believe points us back to this idea and understanding that Jesus wasn't coming to, uh, to, to undermine the law. He was coming to fulfill it. He was coming to be everything that would fulfill and live into the law in order that his death would be our sacrifice, right? So we look at this and we need to understand, Jesus came and started breaking the rules men had created. Pharisees had taken the law of God and they had added so much more to it. They had added so many little things to it. And what I love about this is Jesus was doing so many things that didn't really square up with uh, how the religious elite would like to be treated. You know, it's like taking someone and saying, hey, we're going to go to a really nice restaurant. And they get dressed up and they go to the restaurant, but you take them to a place like, I think it's called Ed DeBevick's. There was another place out in California we had where they mistreat you while you eat. They call you names. 
Like you order a cheeseburger and they're like, really chunky? You're going to eat that and you're like, oh my gosh, I think I'll have a salad. You know, you have those moments where it's like, that's not what you expected to hear. And these, these people, see, these religious elite people are seeing Jesus and he's doing things that are deeply offensive to them. But it's because of their pride. And here's how we know this. The religious elite, the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Jesus' day were powerful. They were always powerful, right? They, they were the most highly educated people around. They knew the scriptures inside and out. They knew the prophets, the law, the Psalms, the Proverbs. They knew it. And they used it and weaponized it for their own gain and their own comfort. They were, in, they were incredibly influential. So influential. If they approved of you, your stock rose. People liked you more. They believed in you. Why? Because these people way up on the upper crust seemed to be favoring you, which meant you were special because they, in some way, had convinced everybody else that they were God's favorite. God liked them best, as seen by their blessings, their religious dedication, right? They were all these things that were so well put together. They looked so good on the outside. But in the end, even Jesus would refer to them as whitewashed tombs or tombs that had been painted. Looks good on the outside, but you're dead on the inside. But these people were powerful and influential. Their approval changed your life. They were politically connected. Make no mistake that when we look at Israel, the nation of Israel. It is a theocracy, which is, um, we're a democracy, right? Of and by and for the people. This is a theocracy, a people of God for his purposes and his plans under his law. And these were the masters of the law. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were the masters of the law. And they were politically connected because to be connected to the law of God and be God's favorite would mean you were, well, you were the head of politics. And finally, they were spiritually superior. They had an air about them that made everyone think that they had a special connection with God, that God liked them best and their prayers mattered more and all these different things. They were superior spiritually to everyone else in their mind and in the minds of people. We know that's not true, but we do know that in in their perception, and we know perception is reality, in their perception and how they were perceived and perceived themselves, they were superior to everybody else. So Jesus comes and starts breaking their rules. He's not breaking the law. He's breaking the rules of the Pharisees and the religious leaders. And one of the things he does, which I find fascinating, is he eats with sinners. He eats with sinners. Now, make no mistake, if these people traveled 80 miles to see Jesus, they would have wanted time with him. And he chooses instead to eat with a guy named Levi and all the tax collectors. I mean, when's the last time you had your IRS friends over for dinner? right? Exactly. That's just not something we do a ton. Levi was, was not well loved um, because of his allegiance to Rome by being a tax collector for them. There would have been prostitutes and different things eating at this meal. And Jesus knew that the religious elite didn't like it. They didn't like that Jesus, well, the Jesus who was doing all these great things and was empowered, uh, God was using him to do powerful things. They wouldn't have liked that Jesus chose to eat with horrible people and not them. They would have been offended on God's behalf because remember, God liked them best, so Jesus should too. That's their mentality. If God's using him, why isn't Jesus choosing us? He was breaking their rules. Jesus also broke their rules because the Pharisees always declared these different fasts and different things they had to do. A fast is when you give up certain things and you use that time for devotion and, um, and different um, faithful disciplines in, in your faith. Um, the, the Pharisees used it as a religious tool over people and used it to shame and disgrace them and elevate themselves. Jesus didn't fast. And it was, um, it was interesting how he avoided the religious rut that they dug so deeply and made people feel ashamed of that they weren't doing. He didn't do what everyone else did to stay in the good graces of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the ones who added to the law of God these fasts and different things. Jesus also did something that was just, I mean, nuts to think about. He forgave sins. 
Even the Pharisees knew that, that they were, you know, they were as perfect as a person could be and God loved them best, but they knew they couldn't forgive sins. And here's this Jesus not valuing their valuable um, status and different things, but he's forgiving people's sins. And he's proving that he's able to forgive sins on earth by doing what? I mean, he asked the rhetorical question, is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or to a paralyzed person rise up and walk? Which the paralyzed person in front of them, they'd be like, there's no way he can do that. And he says, get up, take up your mat, and go home. Right? Proving that not only he has the authority to do that, but also forgive sins. That is a crazy big deal in this, in this scripture. He's naming that he, Jesus, is the Messiah. He's saying these Old Testament scriptures point to me. I am God's lamb. I am the appointed Messiah. And it would have made these people so mad because that's not how it was supposed to work. And finally, Jesus was not afraid, intimidated by, or influenced by the religious elite. He didn't care that they constantly were watching him, trying to affect the way he behaved and trying to trick him with hard questions and shame him and break his ministry ethic. Jesus didn't care. He knew that they were entitled to uh, being heard because everybody always listened to him. And they were entitled to always being correct because they were the smart ones, right? That one friend you can never argue with because they always have the right thing to say back. Even when you're right, they can make you feel like you were wrong. That's how these leaders were. And Jesus was not afraid, influenced by, or intimidated by their rhetorical ability. Jesus stood on the truth. And he did not agree with their claim that they were right. Jesus understood who he was, the way, the truth, and the life. And that enraged the Pharisees because they had set the rules and those rules would benefit their life. But Jesus upends those rules and basically throws away their system of self-aggrandizement and promotion instead of God-focused relationship. I love they were so opposed to Jesus because, well, he was stealing their thunder. But here's the cool part. When you have someone who steals thunder, you often think, okay, is Jesus going to do this for himself? But I think we can easily say that Jesus wasn't doing this for himself. He was doing it in obedience to God. He was doing it to be obedient to God. Jesus was fully obeying God, fulfilling the law, but not being religious. Isn't that interesting? He fulfilled all the religious duties without being religious. And there's, there's something to that. That obedience came from a different place. The first way we know Jesus was um, fully obedient is he stayed on mission. Remember I said that he said to the Pharisees, I came for the sick, right? I came for the sick, not for the healthy. So I'm sitting and eating with sinners because they know they need God. You seem to be perfect and have no interest in repentance. Jesus spent his time with the sick. And Jesus was intent and, and his focus was unbroken on healing the separation that came from sin. Jesus wanted to heal the separation between humanity and the God who created them by dealing with sin head on. He was obedient to God. Another obedience was his life was for the healing of people. His life would be spent in the healing of people, not in a way to extort from people a more comfortable lifestyle for himself. He didn't go get all the best robes, all the best food, and all these different things. Jesus didn't extort by influence a more comfortable life for himself. Rather, every miracle was reflecting on the way that God planned to heal and restore people back to himself. Let me say that again. Every miracle that Jesus did was in some way a reflection of God's plan to heal and restore and bring people back to himself. Which means Jesus in his obedience was showing the heart of God. That God loves and is pleased with relationship, not religion. God doesn't want you to do it because you have to. God wants you to do it because he loves you and you love him. It's about relationship, not religion. Yes, there are times we just do our duty, but there is also something that drives our duty, right? A love of God 
drives us to our duty. Not a sense of, I better do it or God will be mad. But we do it because we first love God. We love him. Relationship, not religion. We see that over and over in Jesus' life. Everything in Jesus' obedience was showing the heart of God and his heart for relationship, not religion. And finally, I love this little part of it. In Jesus' obedience, we can see God was trying to get near people who need him. And we can also notice that it was the religious leaders who blocked people who needed to get to Jesus from getting to him. Think about it. They filled the doorways in the room that Jesus was in. And someone had to tear off the tiles to lower someone who desperately needed the healing touch of Jesus. They had to tear off the roof to lower him in. Why? Because the religious elite were standing in the way. They were preventing people from getting to God. They are watching him, but not relating to him. And I find that interesting. Jesus' overall response to the people who we'll call roof rippers, the friends of the the paralyzed man who brought him to Jesus... What I love about this is that they receive a response from Jesus that I believe is this. One of real joy and pleasure at the way they had torn through the roof to get their friend in front of Jesus. I think Jesus had real joy and pleasure at their faith which caused them to vandalize a property to get someone near him. (coughs) And as we look at that and as we understand that, we can celebrate the fact that their faith caused them to do everything possible to get someone in need in front of Jesus. Their faith caused them to do anything possible to get someone in need in front of the one who could heal it, Jesus. I love that. So it begs the question for you and me. Who do you need to rip the roof off for, right? I think we're in a long line of roof rippers in the church. We are people who are called to get people in need in front of Jesus Christ. Who do you need to rip the roof off for? Who are you on mission for? And do you realize that that mission might offend the religious elite? It might bother people. It might not be how it's always been done. But in obedience, we know that we are valuing our relationship with God over the function of a religious system. Who do you need to rip the roof off for and get them in front of God? The question is so clear. What lengths do you need to go to to get someone in front of Jesus? Not what are you willing to do. What are the lengths, the efforts you need to make to get them in front of Jesus. Imagine with me what it was like that day when the guy's like, there's no way in the room. Like the, the people are looking through the windows, they couldn't get through. And can you imagine the one friend who's like, you know, hey, I mean, nobody's on the roof. I'm like, yeah, oh, get a rope, get a rope. They climb up on the roof, they hoist their friend up, then they tear the roof open. They found any means possible. They found what lengths they would go to to get their friend in front of Jesus. What about you? The calling is the same to you and I as it is to them. Maybe, well, let me ask the question and then answer how we're responding as a church. What lengths do you need to go to to get someone right in front of Jesus? Maybe for you, it's a weird church service time or a weird place, right? Maybe for you, it's a weird service time. One of the things we're doing at the Foundry over this next month is we are launching three new venues. Now, venue is a little different than campus. We are going to launch three new services right here at Foundry, Maine. Three different services and different times so that anyone who can can get people to meet Jesus. We realize our main space it's just too full. It's, it's uncomfortably full. So we're going to make every time we can available so people can come. How are you going to do it? How are you going to get people there? Maybe you're supposed to be part of that service time that's weird or that service location that's odd. 
Sometimes our obedience in joyfully doing the things differently, it actually communicates to people this truth that the church will meet them wherever they're at. We don't get to define like, nope, church only happens on this day, this time. Nope. It actually happens any time we'll tear the roof off to find a way to get people to come and be in front of Jesus, be around his community. When people know that we will do anything to get them in front of Jesus, I believe they feel like the church was a place meant for them to know that Christ is always available to them. He's not just God on Sunday right? He is God all the time. And we are always open and available to receive people who need to be in front of Jesus, who need to be surrounded by the community, the word of God, the worship of his people. We are going to be a church dedicated to that. So maybe it's changing your Sunday routine to go somewhere that a friend would like, to accompany them into a place. So maybe like Foundry West. What up, Foundry West? Like you guys are out there and you're making space for people who maybe couldn't come out to Maine in Zealand because you're out in the west side of Holland, right on the north side. You're out there and you're making room for people to come and be in front of Jesus. Well done. Well done. It takes courage. It takes boldness. And you got to be comfortable with change. I think of See You Monday. Changing Sunday, you know, changing things on Sunday to do church differently. We didn't see a Monday because we realized in the summer in Michigan, people leave to go away. People leave to go camping on the weekend, so we did Monday night s'more church. It turned into see a Monday, and it went from 80 or 90 people to 250 a week. Why? Because I believe people were, were available and so we started doing it, and we're really leaning in. And I look at See You Monday, I'm like, well done. You invite your friends, you eat a meal, you guys are having the time of your life, and doing it differently, meeting God on his terms, not ours. Our terms would be religious. His are always faithful and relationally based. So let's be, like, like think of it this way. What if you invited a friend to your small group, your group, instead of church first? Let him meet some people. Let them come and hear the sermon recap, hear the questions, meet people, enjoy being in a relationship. And when they come to church, they know people. I don't care how you do it. Just get people in front of Jesus, in front of his community, in front of the word of God. So let's be really honest here. There are times where we demand church is on our terms. And we, the church, clog the pathways and the doorways to Jesus because we have said, no, this is how and when you do church. Not so here. Not so here. Let's just rip, rip the roof off of our structures and our patterns and do everything we can to get people as close to Jesus as possible. Like See You Monday. Like Foundry West. Let's have as many services, as many locations, as much fun as is legally allowed. Let's enjoy it. This is awesome. Let's enjoy tearing the roof off at locations, times, venues, and opportunities. Anything that is a faithful way to share the gospel with someone and the gospel community. However we can bring people in front of Jesus, let's do it. Let's do that, and let's just be honest. The invitation is quite simple. No more, hey, this is what's expected. Let's live into, hey, let's be roof rippers. Let's be roof rippers. Let's just tear it off. And say, you know what, God, however you choose to work, whenever you want me here and have me being a part of it, I will obey you because you are faithful. You are good. And we can bring those who we love and know before you and trust that you're going to heal what's broken and transform them into, the, into your image through the word of God, the community of God, and the worship and devotion to God. Friends, I invite you. It is time for our church to become people who understand what it's like to rip the roof off our structures and start meeting people on God's terms, not ours. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we love you and we thank you that you have ripped the roof off of our world and put us in front of you. You have used friends and neighbors and loved ones to pull us close to you. So now, God, we ask that turnabout would be fair play in our lives, that you would turn us from being people who were put in front of you 
to being people who are in relationship with you and love you enough to tear off the roof for other people and get them to you. Give us courage to obey. Not just courage to do our duty, but love for you and relationship that would allow us to do the bold and obedient things. God, we don't know why you're having us uh, do church differently. We just open our hands and we say, Lord, have your own way. Have your way with us. That we, the people of God, would faithfully live in the tension and the hope that is that everyone needs to be before Jesus. And it's our calling to bring them to you in any way we can. Help us to be fun and inventive, cautious at the right times, but also creative and whimsically engaged. May we remember this isn't our idea. The gospel is your idea. It is yours. So Lord, as your spirit leads, give us the courage to obey. And Lord, we just ask, give us the courage to pull that first tile back and start opening up every avenue possible to bring people and set them right in front of you, the one who loves them and died for them. May people find their satisfaction and their peace in you and you alone. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.